Okay, in that case, let's move on. And let's go back to some applications. So far, I'm sure you have noticed that most of the images that we were working with were low resolution when it came to GANs. And there is a reason for that because it wasn't converging. So we saw 64 by 64, we saw 256 by 256, but these are low resolution. Can we increase the resolution to something that is 1024 like this and generate high quality images? That's the objective. You want to generate high quality images. One might say that, okay, just write down your framework, create your neural network. One is a generator. It's gonna take a latent variable. It's gonna take a vector. It's gonna first create four by four features. And then you're gonna keep uh, using transpose convolutions until you get to the order of 1024 by 1024. That's your generator. Give the generated image and the real image to a discriminator. And then this discriminator is gonna give you a single number and do your optimization on that. Theoretically, beautiful. Once you sit behind the computer, you write down this model and it's not gonna converge. It's not gonna give you images or it's not gonna give you high quality images. So this is one of those uh, papers that it's not about the loss function. It's not about your neural network structure. It's about how you train it. So you have to gradually train this neural network step by step. What are you gonna do? First, you generate four by four images. So very low resolution images. They're gonna look like this. This is four by four. You're gonna generate four by four images. Your real images, you're gonna down sample them. You're gonna make them look four by four. And then you give that to a discriminator. And then you train that. Then you need to somehow move to the next step and gradually add convolution, deconvolutions and convolutions. And then look at eight by eight versions of your images, train that train those parameters. And then these parameters are, are the same parameters as before. You're adding new parameters here. You're adding new convolutions. And then you, cap, you keep adding it one after another. And that's why you have the progressive growing. So you're growing your generative neural network. This is beautiful, but things are dis discontinuous. When you go from one step to the next one, you cannot just plug in a new convolution because it's gonna confuse the training process. You want things to happen gradually. You want to go from this step to the next step somehow gradually. And the way that you're gonna do it is let's say you are now at pixel level 16 by 16. So now that's your resolution. And you want to go to 32 by 32. Same thing is happening here. From four by four, you are going to eight by eight. So you're doubling the resolution. This is this step, the first step that you have here. You have a 16 by 16. And by the way, this is gonna be 16 by 16 by, for instance, 512. There are not gonna be three channels here. It's gonna be 512. You're gonna use one by one convolutions, which are just pixel by pixel matrix multiplications to turn the 512 channels to three channels, red, green, and blue. So wherever you see two RGB, it's just a one by one convolution, changing the dimension from 512 to three, and it's pixel wise. Each pixel is gonna use the same weights. Each pixel here is 512 dimensional. You're gonna multiply it by a matrix that is 512 by three, and that's gonna give you a 16 by 16 image in red, green, and blue. You do the same thing here. That is also a one by one convolution. So that's your generator, that's your discriminator, now you want to increase the resolution to go to 32 by 32. The first step, you're gonna do a nearest neighbor filtering. So you're just copying and pasting the same pixel value in four locations because each pixel in this image is gonna turn into four pixels in the next image, in the upsampled one. So you're just gonna copy and paste and that's nearest neighbor filtering. You're gonna do a convolution and that's gonna give you a 32 by 32 with some number of channels. But let's forget about this route for a second. Let's set alpha to be zero. What's gonna happen? You take a 16 by 16 image, you do nearest neighbor filtering, and then you turn it into red, green, blue. So this is basically the same operation here. So it's the same network and you are not adding any new parameters. 
So the only thing that you're adding is nearest neighbor filtering. So you're just copying and pasting. So nothing happens there. So this route is exactly this route here. Same thing down there. You start with a 32 by 32 image, you downsample it, then you turn it into red, green, blue. And if alpha is zero, this is exactly this framework here. It's exactly the same neural network. You're just adding uh, down sampling, which is av average pulling. So you take four pixels and then you average them into one pixel. And the other one is just nearest neighbor filtering. So it's exactly this route. If alpha is zero, but then during training, the same way that you can have a learning rate schedule, you can have a schedule for alpha. You continuously change it from alpha being zero to alpha being one. If alpha is one, then you're forgetting that route gradually. And then you're gonna be in the route that is giving you the next resolution. So now this is the way that you're gonna progressively grow your GANs. So once alpha is one, you forget the previous route and you're now in the route ready for the next step. And that's gonna give you this framework. But these are engineering papers. See, a lot of experimentation is gonna go on on how to choose alpha. So there is no mathematical theory for how to change alpha. Okay, perfect. So not only you need to do that, the way that you train your neural network, we saw this observation. So for this, I'm gonna go back to this slide here. This one we covered just as a reminder. Do you remember mini batch discrimination? And we had to do that to deal with mode collapse. And we wanted our observations to look at the other observations in a mini batch. So not only look at yourself, but look at the look at your neighbors. And maybe that's gonna help you pull out of mode collapse. The question is, is there a simpler way of achieving the same objective or at least similar results? Let's say you are sitting at this location. This is gonna be four by four by 512. So each pixel is gonna be 512 dimensional and that's your batch. This is where the batch is gonna come in. So N is your mini batch, the size of your mini batch. And that's your feature map. What we are gonna do is gonna take an average over the data. So I is the index for the data. F is the index for the channels. X and Y are the indices for the pixels. You compute the mean and standard deviation of your mini batch. Up until this point, it is similar to batch normalization. But now we are gonna use this statistic in a different way. We're gonna take that and average it over all of your channels, over all of your pixels. So you're doing an averaging on that. And then you're just gonna, this formula here is just telling you that the first 512 feature maps, you're gonna keep them the same. So it's an identity, but then you're concatenating this Z value. Basically you're broadcasting it and then concatenating it channel wise. Now, why? If X was N by 512 by four by four, Y is gonna be N by 513 by four by four. So this is a way for you to look at your neighbors, look at the statistics of your neighbors. And it turns out that this is gonna help you deal with mode collapse slightly. Another feature is how you initialize your neural network. So in part one of the course, we go through a paper, it's a theoretical paper, and it tells us how to properly initialize convolutional neural network when you have ReLU as your activation. And uh, the initialization scheme is, the paper is by Kaiming He. It's called Del Delving Deep into Rectifiers. It's by Kaiming He. And the scheme, the initialization scheme is called Kaiming initialization because the first author is Kaiming. But how are we gonna initialize it? It turns out that uh, the number of channels that you have for your convolutions and your filter size matters. For each layer, you're gonna have a different filter size. You're gonna have different channel dimension. You're gonna create an N, which is K squared by D. And then you're gonna create C. C is the inverse of your standard deviation that you're gonna use to initialize your weights. And then this is how you're gonna initialize your weights. You're gonna sample from normal distribution, and then you're gonna divide those values by C. And if your variables, if what you are optimizing over is W hat I, 
And if you are using a stochastic gradient descent or ADAM optimization, it could happen that for some layers and some weights, your learning rate is too big. And for some layers and some weights, your learning rate is too small. So you're going to have a learning rate that is at the same time big and small. And that could be the reason that your neural network is not converging properly. So they say that in this paper, rather than your parameters being W hats, let your parameters be W. And then these are just some other layers in your, neur your neural network. So you are just dividing by C. Now, if you, all of your variables are coming from a normal that is zero and one, they're gonna have the same scale. Therefore, their learning rate is gonna be equalized. So it's not the case that for some of the variables, your learning rate is too big and for some of them it's too small. So that's another trick for how you train your neural network. Another trick is pixel-wise feature vector normalization. So the first paper that generated deep learning as we know it today was the paper by Jeffrey Hinton uh, in 2012, and they were using local response normalization in that paper. We know that normalization is important. And they were using a typical uh, version of normalization called local response. But then batch normalization came and then people stopped using local response normalization because batch normalization was enough for classification. But, but it turns out that for GANs and for generation, actually local response normalization helps and it's better than batch normalization. So what is the idea of local response normalization? This is a simplified version of that. But what is the idea if the activity of one of these features or one of these channels, J is counting the channel, if the activity of one of your channels increases, the activity of this channel here should increase as well. If this is channel I, if the activity of one of the channel J's increases to compensate for that and to have the same level of activity, the activity of channel I should increase as well. So this is a way of creating competition between activities of your neural network. We know that convolutions are gonna look at your pixels X and Y in a local manner. So the near, the neighboring pixels are gonna have impact on each other but then the channels are independent. This is one way of uh, creating competition across channels so that your channels are talking to each other as well. And at the same time, it is normalizing. So these values are not going to get too big or too small. So this trick is coming back for GANs. So what, are, what loss function are you going to use in the end? You have multiple options. You can use the loss function from uh, the Wasserstein GANs type of loss functions or you can do the least square GANs type of loss function. So these two papers we covered, they are low resolution. Either of them are gonna do fine and you can increase that to high resolution. So these are now high resolution images and you can see that they look much better. And these are generated images. And these are also generated images here. And they're 1024 by 1024. Okay, any questions? Is everything clear? Okay.